Today, as we're starting off our Unit 8, which is our unit on trigonometry, we are returning to the Pythagorean theorem. We saw this briefly way back in Unit 1, back in September, because there were a few times when we needed the formula. Uh, we're going to dive a little more deeply now into notating the triangle. We're using the formula again a handful of times, but we're also going to be working with simplifying radicals. So here we are starting off with our Pythagorean theorem. So if you take a look at the box here, there's the long and wordy explanation. But essentially you can boil it down to this if-then statement. This is our conditional statement. And it says if there's a right triangle, then you can use that formula of a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You'll notice we can write it forwards or backwards. So here it is c squared first, and then that's equal to the a squared plus b squared. And there's a reason for that, and I'm going to use it this way today specifically so that it'll tie in more smoothly into tomorrow's lesson. And so here we have our if-then statement. In other words, if you don't have a right triangle, the formula won't work. In terms of naming your triangle, notice that you're always going to put the sides with little letters and the angles with big uppercase letters, right? So side little a will be positioned opposite angle a. Since they've already got side little a here, opposite the height will find us down here in the bottom right corner, that's angle a. Angle b is opposite side little b, and angle c is opposite side little c, and little c is always assigned to the hypotenuse. And we know the hypotenuse is opposite the right angle. So little c must go here on the hypotenuse, but the a and the b can go in either place. All right, so with that little introduction, let's take a look at our examples. Right, so um, once you have identified that right angle, find the side opposite that. That must get the little c in terms of our formula. That is the hypotenuse there. The two legs don't matter which is the a or which is the b. And again, the formula itself doesn't matter which way you set it up, but I will purposefully select this method with the c squared first so that it ties in more smoothly with tomorrow's lesson. So the hypotenuse is what I'm going to list first, and that happens to be a variable. So x squared equals 7 squared plus 24 squared. With some of these bigger values, just use your calculator here. 24 squared gives me 576. And when we add that with the 49, we get 625. To get the power of 2 by, uh, to get rid of the power of 2, to get the x by itself, we need the opposite of the exponent of 2, which is the square root sign. And um, that happens to be a perfect square. In other words, we can get that as an integer result of 25. No units on this particular problem. But if you happen to have a story problem, we want to make sure we pay attention to the units as well. All right. So here we have a six-foot board. This is the six-foot board you see here. And it's like helping to secure the door in place. The, it rests under the doorknob. And the base of the board is five feet away from the bottom of the door. So this is the board. This is the top of the board. This is the base of the board. That base of the board is five feet away from the bottom of the door. So that's the five feet you see there. So approximately how high above the ground is the doorknob. So there is your, there's your height. So with the right angle provided by the door and the floor, opposite that is the hypotenuse, that has to get the letter C. So six goes here in place of letter C. So six squared equals, and then it doesn't matter which is the A and the B, five squared plus x squared. So we get 36 equals 25 plus x squared. Subtract 25 from both sides. And uh, we will get the x squared by itself. That gives us 11. And we'll take the square root of both sides. Now 11 is not a perfect square, of course. And that would be our exact answer in feet. But here it says approximately how high. So in this case, we actually want a decimal value. So let's do a quick review on rounding decimal values. Let's type in that square root of 11. And here you can see it says 3.3166. So let me just jot down 
more decimals than we actually need so we can talk about it on the paper without that glare getting in the way. Typically, we're going to round to two decimal places unless it says any differently. So there is your decimal point. That means we're going to take a look at finding out what kind of numbers do we want to the right of that decimal point. And since we want two decimal places, we're counting two values to the right of that decimal point. So the question is, do we want 3.31 or do we round it up to 3.32? There is no rounding down. We never round that to 3.30. It's either gonna stay this way or, or it's gonna round up. So you have to take a look at the third number and see how does that influence the number right in front of it, right? So if that's a five or bigger, we round up to a 0.32. If this were smaller than a five, like a four or a three or a two or a one, then this simply stays as it is as a 0.31. Again, it does not round down. It either stays the same or it rounds up. Since this value of 6 is bigger than 5, we're going to round this up to 3.32. So there's a quick review on rounding your decimals. Here in the next row of problems, we're going to be using the Pythagorean formula again, but this time with some radical values thrown in as a review for radicals. We do have right triangles, so even though it's not drawn, we recognize that the right angle will be formed by those perpendicular sides. We will solve for x, but this time we don't want decimals. We'll leave our answer in simplified radical form. Opposite the right angle is your hypotenuse. That gets the letter c. So c squared equals the a squared plus b squared. So 8 squared equals 2 root 7 quantity squared plus x squared. There's my variable. Okay. This is what we're reviewing here. How do you square a value that has both an integer and a radical, like the 2 root 7? So remember, I use the margin space over here. If you have a 2 root 7 quantity squared, what that means is you have two identical copies of this being multiplied together. So you have a 2 root 7 times itself. So when you're thinking about multiplying this together, you multiply integer with integer and the radical with the radical. So 2 times 2 gives you an integer of 4, and root 7 times root 7 is a root 49. Now it just so happens that's a perfect square, and the square root of 49 turns into integer 7. Be careful, it's not the square root of 7, it's just the integer of 7. So 4 times 7 is 28. So all of that work just for us to figure out that 2 root 7 squared gives you a 28. We'll subtract 28 from both sides, we get 36. And in this particular case, we get an answer of exactly 6, right? We're taking the square root of both sides to get that 6. There's no units on that problem, so 6 units, whatever they happen to be. But that's the concept between squaring an integer and a radical together like that. Okay. Here in part B, there's a square root. Opposite that is the hypotenuse, so the 24 gets the letter C. So 24 squared equals 22 squared plus the x squared. Again, with really big numbers like this, we're just using our calculator, so we get 576. 22 squared is 484. I'm going to move all of my constant terms to the same side by subtracting 484 from both sides, and this gives us 92. All right, so again, we're not allowed to have decimals, and 92 is not a perfect square. So that means we have to simplify 92. We talked about this in the previous lesson. You can take that 92 and just help yourself by checking to see, is it divisible by values like 4 or is it divisible by 16? Here it is divisible by 4. We get 23. So that means we can factor this into 4 times 23. And 4 is a perfect square. So we can take the square root of 4, which is integer 2, but we cannot take the square root of 23, it just stays 
as a root 23. So that's the exact length of that missing side of the triangle. Again, no specific units are applied, so it's just that in units. Next, we have a bit of a problem here because we're doing more than just the Pythagorean theorem. We want to find the area of the triangle. So we have an isosceles triangle. Remember that is two sides with the same length. They're both 17. So when you draw this, draw it with the line of symmetry going right down the middle like so. These are all in meters here. Now you notice we don't have a right angle, so when you draw that line of symmetry right down the middle, this is also where the height of the triangle is, and the height is perpendicular to the base, and there's your right triangle. So we're really taking a look at half of the triangle here, just so that we can take a look at using our Pythagorean formula to find that missing height. We know the slanted side is the 17 meters, the base is now cut in half, so half of 16 is 8. And we can use our Pythagorean theorem to find that information. So let's do that first. Again, opposite the right angle is your hypotenuse. So the 17 gets the letter C. So we have 17 squared equals 8 squared plus the H squared. 17 squared is 289. We'll subtract the 64 from both sides to get 225, and lucky us, that is a perfect square. So when we take the square root of 225, our height is exactly 15. So now we know 15 is the height of the triangle. That's sort of step one. We had the base of 16, we are missing the height, but now that we have both dimensions, we can find the area of the triangle. So here the triangle is base times height divided by 2. So that means our base is, now don't use the base of 8. We want the original triangle because that's the original problem that they gave us with the base of 16. So 16 times that height of 15 all divided by 2. And uh, because we are talking about meters and this is area, don't forget meters squared are the units for this. Now that's the core of what we're doing in our lesson. We're using the Pythagorean theorem, sometimes with integers, sometimes with decimal answers, sometimes with simplified radical form. That's the bulk of what we're doing. But there's a little extra that we need to take a look at, and it's on the following page. It's something called the Pythagorean triples. So this is meant to be something that if you recognize it, you can use it to your advantage, but we don't have to memorize these numbers. You don't have to memorize the chart. What we're really just looking at here is the very top row of that chart. That's really all that you want to look at. And even of those numbers, these are the most common. So we're going to talk about those in a moment. All right, so the three numbers that you see are representing the three sides of a triangle. It just so happens it's not any triangle. These will form a right triangle. So it says a Pythagorean triple is a set of three integers, a, b, and c, a, b, and c, that satisfy that equation that we've been using. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So in other words, the largest number is always the hypotenuse. So if you see a 3 and a 4 and a 5, that 5 gets the letter C. It is your hypotenuse. If you see the 5 and the 12 and the 13, 13 is the biggest, that gets the letter C. That's your hypotenuse. So you're not solving for a missing side. We're telling you what the sides are. So if we were to put that in a picture form, that's what you see down here. This is the right triangle where one leg is 3, one leg is 4, and the hypotenuse is on the 5. And so what we're saying is there's a certain combination of integers that just so happen that when you use the formula, you get a true statement, meaning it is a right triangle. So, for example, if you had a triangle where you had a side of 3 and a hypotenuse of 5, and that's all you knew, and you're trying to figure out what is that missing side, 
you could use the Pythagorean theorem and solve it out. But if you recognize the pattern that 3 and 4 and 5 are guaranteed to form those three sides of a right triangle, you can save yourself a lot of time, skip the calculations, and just say, aha, that must be a 4. Now, if you're not sure, put in your Pythagorean theorem and find out. So if that works, then that means any triangle that's scaled up or scaled down from those numbers will also work. So if you were to double those side lengths, you get a 6, 8, 10. If you were to triple those side lengths, you get a 9, 12, 15. If you were to multiply those by 10, you'd get a triangle of sides 30 and 40 and 50. And again, you don't have to memorize this. It's just a pattern. If you see the pattern, you can use it. You're not going to be tested on it or anything. But jump down to that example below. Do you see example five? Take a look at this triangle. Do you see this triangle here? We have sides of 30 and 40. Do you know what the hypotenuse has to be? Now, it's here in the chart, 30, 40, and 50. There it is. Meaning it's based off of a three, four, five triangle. But if you don't see it, that's okay. You can still use your Pythagorean theorem. Opposite the right angle is the hypotenuse. That gets the letter C. C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Let's, let's check it out. Let's see what happens here. So 30 squared plus 40 squared. That's going to be 900 plus 1600. That is going to be 2500. And when you take the square root of 2500, you're going to get... 50. Did you know that answer was 50? All right, so you can still use the formula, but if you pick up on the pattern of, hey, that 30 and 40 that they gave us in the diagram are two legs of the triangle, that's just like the 3 and the 4, then that means we could figure out that the third side must be some multiple of 5, in this case 5 times bigger. So that's one way you can approach it, um, or you can think of it of a as a, well, let's just scale it down 10 times. So 10 times smaller than 30 would be 3, and 10 times smaller than 40 would be a 4. That's essentially the pattern that we're looking at. That's your 3, 4, 5 triangles. So if you take the 5 and scale it up 10 times, that should be a 50. So we call these Pythagorean tri triples just because they're sets of numbers that come in sets of 3. We tend to use these the most often, so if you see any of these triangles in our notes or in our homework or on a quiz, for example, you have permission to use the pattern instead of showing all of the calculations. But that's essentially what the numbers are supposed to represent.